Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation again, Mary and uh, colleagues. Um, <clears throat> delighted to be here in such a good company on a Friday afternoon. Um, if I can, I'd like to um, begin briefly by um, setting out why the European Union is so important uh, in the context of Northern Ireland, um, where I think the Brexit, where I think the British government has gone wrong and offer some wider reflections on the current state of the Brexit debate, if you will permit me. Um, I'll try and brief, uh, in case I'm accused of running down the clock, like get Mrs May. Um, Brexit and Northern Ireland, the EU is an assumed participant in the Good Friday Agreement settlement. Not a guarantor, like the two governments, but an enabler and facilitator, a stabiliser, a common denominator, and an honest broker in the landscape providing a new and valuable dimension to the otherwise binary politics of Northern Ireland, helping to blur harsh edges. And the EU has helped to embed peace and prosperity in Northern Ireland in recent decades in that most practical of ways, money. Northern Ireland receives around 600 million euro a year from the EU in a mixture of farm payments and structural funds. And just bear in mind, that Northern Ireland is a population of 1.8 million people. <coughs> Meanwhile, intra-Irish trade has grown by 4% a year every year since the Good Friday Agreement was agreed in 1998, with 30,000 people and 6,000 lorries passing over the currently invisible border each day. A century after the Irish were sold a pup by the British and tripped into fighting for the rights of small nations in the First World War, the EU guarantees just that equality of prestige between member states, large and small. Ireland and the UK have been equal participants in the EU since 1973. Perhaps that is why the British have been so uncomfortable in Europe, forced to treat smaller members of it as equals. I think that thought can you. Although 88% of nationalists in Northern Ireland voted to remain back in June 2016, only 34% of unionists did so with many perceiving the EU as a threat to British sovereignty and their self-identity. I would make the point that, of course, they're happy to take the cash, loyal to the half-crown, as they say. But what has Britain got wrong throughout these negotiations over the last couple of years? Throughout this dismal process, British ministers have overplayed their hand, <coughs> underestimating Irish diplomatic prowess, displaying an epic disregard to the complexities involved as they relate to Ireland, particularly around the border. If you will permit me, the approach has been in turn. Don't worry, Paddy, we'll get to the border. This was reflected in Theresa May's Lancaster House speech about the mechanics of Brexit back in January 2017. She promised to, quote, deliver a practical solution on the Irish border as soon as we can, with all the wafty nonchalance that we have subsequently come to expect from British ministers. Then it moves to, it's okay, Paddy, there's a technological fix to the border. This was David Davis, the second to last Brexit secretary. You last longer as a marshal of Dodge City in this government as Brexit secretary. Who blindly assumed that a few cameras on the border would fudge the issue. Except, as the House of Commons, Northern Ireland Committee, and many others have pointed out, there is no equivalent technological solution to the complexities of the, of the Irish border anywhere in the world, and the technology does not in fact exist. And if it did exist, it would take years to implement, or we've got 29 days. Policing border infrastructure would, in the words of the Police Federation of Northern Ireland, make their officers sitting ducks. And it's, all, it's very likely that you would see a resumption of violence around the border and the unravelling and the fraying of the edges of the peace process dimension to the Good Friday Agreement settlement. Still, this belief lingers. The right wing Legatum Institute think tank recently suggested that drones or airships could be used to police the Irish border, noting in a piece of understatement that these solutions are subject to a number of limitations, not least weather and cost, or indeed surface to air missiles. <laughs> Okay, Paddy, so we'll have a backstop to avoid the hard border. The backstop, of course, was a British suggestion, in case anyone forgets. Not that you would know, given backstop has been replaced with backsliding ever since. Last month, the Daily Telegraph splashed with the headline, PM's Plan B, 
Good Friday deal could be rewritten. The paper reported that ministers hoped that by adding text to the Good Friday Agreement, promising no hard border, they would buy off the Irish government and avoid having to commit the UK to the backstop, which of course ensures that, uh, that there, is, there is no regulatory divergence between both jurisdictions. The obvious problem is that the Good Friday Agreement is an international treaty registered with the United Nations. Whitehall can't take the tipex out and start changing it as it likes. What does that tell you, though, about the level of panic and magical thinking in Whitehall? Sorry, Paddy, the DUP doesn't like the backstop. Although 56% of Northern Ireland's voters chose to remain, the DUP is calling the shots courtesy of Theresa May's rash decision to call a general election in June 2017. Yet the backstop remains the bare minimum that is needed to avoid a hard border and even positions Northern Ireland as a gateway between the EU and the UK. If you take the identity politics out of this, the utilitarian aspects of this are actually incredibly positive. The, the, the backstop is supported by the business community and the farming lobby in Northern Ireland, both historically favourable towards unionism. Their opinion of the DUP at the moment is on principle. Yet the internecine politics of the Conservative Party and its arrangement with the DUP are relegating the national interest, increasing the risk of a no deal, a hard border, and damaging bilateral relations with the Irish Republic. Thankfully, there are emerging signs of the ERG, the European Research Group of Conservative Backbenchers, is now split between zealots and complete head cases. The zealots include now apparently the DUP, who appear to be resigning from their blood red line um, of what Arlene Foster described as the toxic backstop. So the U-turn of all U-turns is, uh, is currently on the way it would seem. Um, and if that's not enough, then we unfortunately revert back to, unfortunately, Paddy, it's all your fault. This was David Davis complaining about the Irish government playing hardball during negotiations, suggesting that this had stymied progress and, and, and damaged Britain's bargaining position. Quote, we had a change of government south of the border, and with quite a strong influence from Sinn Féin, and that had an impact in terms of their approach, David Davis said back in April, which was Declan is fully well aware, there has been no change of government in Ireland at all, which tells you everything about the briefs that David Davis reads. The seminal mistake um, the British government has unfortunately made has been to assume that it was possible in these negotiations to isolate Ireland. The Commission and the remaining EU26 have backed the Irish government all the way, partly to face down Britain in what are very tough negotiations, clearly, but also to defend the EU's integrity, cognizant, no doubt, that other member states may have similar ideas about departing in the future. The bottom line is Ireland and the EU are indivisible, with 29 days to go. A British Prime Minister's fate now rests on the approval of the Irish. A wry smile is breaking up somewhere on the ascetic countenance of Eamon de Valera's ghost. <laughs> of course, the irony is that the backstop is only needed as long as Northern Ireland exists. We are approaching the centenary of partition, and there will be little for unionists to celebrate. Brexit is the beginning of the end for Northern Ireland. An accelerant poured over the dry tinder of demographic and electoral changes that will, in all likelihood, see Ireland unified over the next decade anyway. If I may, I just wanted to offer a few thoughts on the bigger picture. Um, in a sense, in my mind, you've got Irish Brexit, which is all the deleterious consequences as they affect the entire island of Ireland, most particularly Northern Ireland. But there is, of course, English Brexit, how the rest of the UK pulled and skewed particularly Northern Ireland and Scotland, out of the EU, clearly against the wishes of the majority of people there. Um, I just wanted to give a few thoughts really on the debate around a second referendum and to strike for discussion's sake a slightly discordant note. Um, I remain, as an observer of these things, concerned that lessons have not been learned from the first people's vote in June 2016. That's what it was. There is scant evidence the public has appreciably changed its mind in the intervening two and a half years, despite the shambolic way the negotiation has been conducted thus far. Securing Britain's role at the heart of Europe in the long term must be our priorities as pro-Europeans. 
But my question, my question I will leave hanging is, do we abandon the short term in the hope of winning another referendum in the medium term to secure the long term? Any second referendum, to my mind, risks being lost. We've got to get this right. To lose again risks killing off the European calls for a generation. We can't afford that to happen. For the best motives, people calling for a second referendum, but we're not talking about how it will be won. It's an unlikely prospect, if I was running the Brexit campaign and the second referendum, I would have a slogan that simply said, tell them again, tell them again, to, to, to weaponise the fact that there is even a second referendum being held and used against pro-Europeans. So what is our response to that? <clears throat> Until we are clear on how we approach a second referendum, we should approach the whole idea cautiously. And I'll just leave that thought there and perhaps we can have a discussion.